Uh, and I've watched some of your interviews. You were discussing something having to do with how to make boxing popular again. But part of it was along the lines of, uh, in the old days, the mob ruled a number of fighters. Okay, Probably most of them. Anybody that had a shot was going to be given a shot. There was some mob guy that was... Uh, that was, uh, you know, uh, in control of them. Mm. Even with that presence gone, it seems to me there are very few people that control most of the fighters today, right? The promoters mm. decide who's going to get the shot. Oh, absolutely. I think boxing is, it's been, it's been the kind of game that has, it's attracted people with hearts of gold, you know, like um, Mr. Rooney Sr. Costamato, you know, these people want to help uh, kids progress in this world. Boxing gives them discipline, it gives them a focus which hopefully can uh, overflow into other parts of their lives. But the rank truth about it is that uh, from time immemorial, prize fighting in the, the professional ranks. Uh, the honor of the amateur ranks pretty well goes away. It's always been some sort of uh, criminal fraternity or some, you know, heavy-handed dudes who are running the show uh, simply because of the nature of the way prize fighting is organized. So um, in the first, uh, in, in the middle part of the century in this country, it was the Italian mob that held sway uh, through front organizations in the rest of society, the way they penetrated the political and the economic fields. In boxing, the front organization was the uh, IBC, the International Boxing Club, which was run by a blue blood called um, Steve Norris. And you had Truman Gibson, an Amer African-American lawyer. But these were the front men. At the back of it were people like Frankie Carbo and Blinky Palermo. And um, they ran it as a means of earning money and controlling fighters, becoming a monopoly interest. Well, the uh, United States Supreme Court broke up that monopoly at the end of the 1950s. Uh, but boxing was not rid of the mobsters they merely became, or they continued to be undercover managers, undercover promoters, like James Napoli, who controlled... Well, Napoli. more recently, uh, and I, I don't know how much power he has today, but Don King is the guy that could decide who gets a shot and who doesn't get a shot, right? I mean, uh, Absolutely. And what my point was, that after the IBC, uh, although it looked as if, you know, the folk, central focus of, mad, uh, of boxing in those days was Madison Square Garden in the 1960s, post-IBC. So the mob was still in control. But then after the mob, um, who still have their tentacles in one or two areas, but after them came the alphabet soup organizations, you know, the WBC, WBA, and also big promoters like Bob Arum and Don King. So, and they're the guys who decide, and they're the people who collect the fighters. They, you know, they well, these days, if there's going to be a fight of any, of any import, mm. you're going to do HBO for three weeks on both guys' training. It's a whole big production. It's not like giving two talented people a chance to go at it with each other. It's, it's plucking somebody and saying, this is, this is who I'm making a star out of. No? Um, yes and no, because we're in a situation here where boxing is uh, it's at a very low ebb. You know, you can't, you can't just manufacture somebody overnight, so they have to have some measure of a name. The problem is in the old days where you at least had, uh, you see in the old days, you know, if we just go back to the 1920s, 1930s, boxing was all over the place neighborhood clubs boxing uh, uh, it, it, it had its big areas of popularity in the 20s and the 30s and then it began to diminish in the 1950s with uh, too much exposure on television okay after that you had Ali come and he resurrected the sports 
and it continued in the 1970s that at least you know ABC and, uh, uh, and probably NBC one of the networks would be regularly publicizing, publicizing fights and it would make superstars out of the Sugar Ray Leonard's of this this world you don't have that today they've only got cable so in a way although what you you, you mentioned like you know Pacquiao is going to fight uh, Joshua Clotty well Pacquiao we know his reputation great fighter Clotty the wider public other than boxing aficionados will not know him but they will devote a lot of time to him um, but it just shows you that in, in today's boxing world um, it shows you there are very very few stars if you go back to the 80s I mean, but there's there's no shortage of athletes. There's no shortage of people deserving of a chance. There's no shortage of matches that could be made for money, if people chose to do that. Now, how do you get around that? How do you come to that? Uh, boxing's always had politics about it. Uh, about it. So, the, a natural fight, Mayweather versus uh, Pacquiao, just isn't happening for various reasons. Um, but you're talking about championship fights. I'm talking yeah. about something less than championships. There used to be uh, more visible, more better paying boxing that did not necessarily have to be championship fights, right? Uh, yeah, I mean those days, you know, you had competitive fights. Mm -hmm. You go back to the 1960s, Madison Square Garden, and you had guys like George Benton, uh, Joey Giardello, Rubin Carter. Uh, apart from Giardello, none of those guys were, were world champions. Although if you put them in today's scenario, they would easily become world champions because of the, the way it's been split up with the organizations. In today's world, you, 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 they don't put competitive fights, let's put it that way. Because a lot of fights, if you have a good main bill fight, uh, unfortunately that's what it's going to be. The under bill, uh, that is the supporting bouts, uh, it's usually going to be one guy against a duff. You know, in other words, somebody who doesn't stand a chance. So they're, they're less competitive fights. But Sometimes that's actively done by the promoters. But Bob, you're, you're in the business. You're in the business now, in the ring, in the, you know, in the fight. All right? And uh, what I see is that if uh, you have somebody has a talented kid, an undefeated kid from, say, Jersey City, and you have a kid the same weight class that's undefeated from Philly, Okay, but they're both on their way up. Say they're both 15 and 0. They don't want to take the chance. They don't want a loss on Somebody's got to lose. They don't want a loss. They want to keep building them up, keep feeding them, and then get them that big money shot. For, for a 15 and 0 kid that no one knows about, but he's talented, to fight another 15 and 0 kid that has talent and nobody knows him, it's too much of a risk. Because somebody's going to lose, and now they're less marketable to get that big shot. Isn't that a problem in the long run, if you don't do those fights? It is a problem in the long run, yeah, but that's, that's where we're at in boxing, I think. Mm -hmm. Okay. But isn't it because this lack of talent, the fact that you could at least spread it out, that, okay, if one of those guys loses, mm -hmm. there's still quite a few other 15 and 0 guys, but in today's hey, world... Hey, 15 and 1 isn't bad. Okay. Yeah, it's in not. In boxing, it's not like I, M MMA. You can lose one fight, yeah, but yeah. then you come back. But in boxing, it's a different culture. It's a different. It's a different animal. There was a quote from the book. I don't know which fight this is. Um, De Paula said to I think his manager, "I'll never go 15 rounds in my life." Right? Do you remember yeah. what fight that was? It, that might have been before he fought uh, Dick Tiger. A fight which he um, he actually lost on points. It might have been the fight actually before he fought Foster for the title, the one that is suspected of being uh, mm -hmm. uh, a fix you know, on the part of the Paula, his uh, group. But but you used it as an example of the guy. The guy's mentality and his he, outlook to life. And he wouldn't train. That's right. Too. Um, that encapsulates Frankie de Paula. He had so much natural. Uh, ability and talents but he wasn't prepared to put in the extra work and no matter how talented you are you know Michael Jordan Wayne Gretzky you know Muhammad Ali these guys always put in the work that went along with the talent and so uh, the pull in the, at the end of the day all he had was that uh, punch mm -hmm. um, and he could not develop uh, his talents 